Okay, so this is our notes for introduction to angles, and the first topic is naming angles. And if we read this first paragraph here, we see that it says an angle is a set of points consisting of two different rays that have the same endpoint called a vertex, and the rays are the sides of the angle. So if we look at this, we have a point here. Point A is the vertex because that is a part of both rays. It's a part of ray AC and it is a par part of ray AB. So that is the common point of two different rays. That is where the rays connect and the angle is formed. Um, it says in the next paragraph ways that we can name an angle. And we see that when there's only one angle on a page or on screen, you can name the angle simply by its vertex. You can call it angle A, and that's fine. But whenever you have more than one angle, that could be called angle A. So, for instance, if I were to add another ray here, if I said angle A, I wouldn't know which angle you're talking about. So now you cannot use that single letter name. You have to use the three point name. So if I'm talking about the angle up here, I can name it with the point from the side, the point on the vertex point from another side. So angle C, A, B, and that's what you have here. Um, or that same angle, if you reverse the order, You can say angle B, A, C, and then you get this angle here. So as long as you name a point from a side, the vertex in the middle, and a point from another side, the key there is the vertex point is always in the middle of the name when using three points. And then the last way they give us is sometimes angles are numbered. So we see this number one here, and that number one is the name of the angle because it's inside the interior region of the angle. This is called the interior. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And it's placed near the vertex. So that is the number affiliated with that angle. So we can call it angle one. So those are the different ways we can name the angles. I would mention something about the regions of angles. So whenever we look at angles, an angle has three regions. And a region is a collection of the points. So that means there's a collection of points in here that's the interior region there's a collection of points out here that's the exterior region do you know where the third collection of points is the third collection of points is the angle itself there's a bunch of points on it and those points are neither interior nor exterior so that is the third region so an angle divides a plane into three regions the interior region the exterior region and the angle itself it's important to know these uh, regions because, as you just saw in the previous slide, when we were talking about naming the angle, we said we put the number in the interior region. So then you know where to place the number. Okay. So we just want to practice naming these angles. So if we look at question number one, it says write three names for the angle. Since there's no other angle that could be called angle Q, we can say this is angle Q. Then we can use the three point method. So angle, remember Q has to be the middle point when using three letters. So P, Q, R, or angle R, Q, P. So those are three names for the first one. Angle two, we can call it angle one, angle Y, angle X, Y, Z, angle Z, Y, X. So any three names there would satisfy question two. And then for, angle, for question three, we have angle two, angle E, angle FED, angle DEF. Okay, so here we have the protractor postulate. And the first thing I want to note to you here is that the protractor has uh, the numbers from zero to 180, being measured twice on its uh, layout there. So we have to make sure that we are looking at the correct line of numbers when using a protractor. So 
we're going to look at that with this angle that we have here, this angle AOB. So the protractor postulate basically says that between any two measurements on the same row of numbers, you can find the measure of the angle. So if we take the absolute value of their differences, then we would have the angle measure. So you see this 40 and this 180. If I were to take the absolute value of 40 minus 180, that would equal the absolute value of negative 140, which would equal 140 degrees. But if we look at it on this row from zero, we would go from zero to 140. We see that it's 140 degrees. But what happens when our angle isn't on a zero? So if we were to draw an angle Let's put a point D there. So now we see that I need to stay on the correct row. If I'm using the top row, the top row has me at 110. So I can take the absolute value of 110 minus, follow the top row, and we see 40, which equals the absolute value of 70, which equals 70 degrees. Or if we took the bottom row, we can say we're going from 70 to 140. If I did the absolute value of uh, 140 minus 70, it equals 70 again. And we see that we didn't have any zeros here. That's what the protractor postulate is saying. Just like with the ruler postulate, we were using the absolute value of two um, measurements, and that was giving us the length of a segment. We're doing the same thing here with the protractor. The absolute value of the difference of the two numbers on the same row, and then the absolute value will make sure it turns into a positive uh, so that we get the angle measure. When we measure our angles, we can classify them. So notice that acute angles are values greater than zero and less than 90. So acute angles, they are greater than zero degrees less than 90 degrees. Notice it's not greater than or equal to. If it was equal to zero degrees, there's no angle. An angle at zero degrees doesn't exist. You can't see it. If it was equal to 90 degrees, well, then that's a different classification. Right angles measure 90 degrees. That means right angles are equal to 90 degrees. An obtuse angle is greater than 90, less than 180. Greater than 90, less than 180. Again, no equal to, but a straight angle is equal to 180. So if angles fall in those measures, you should be able to identify them as acute, right, obtuse, or straight. So let's practice this. It says find the measure of each angle, then classify. So question A, GHK. You find G, H, and K. If we highlight that angle, we can then say, if I'm starting from the zero, I want to stay on that path all the way to the angle. That looks like it's 125 degrees. So for A, angle G, H, K equals 125 degrees, which is obtuse because it's greater than 90. If we look at j h l so again start at j go to h go to l we highlighted the angle if we start at zero and we keep on that path to the angle it's 90 so we can say that angle for problem b angle j h l is equal to 90 degrees it is a right angle and for problem c angle l h k If we highlight from L to H to K, we see that neither of them start at zero. None of the sides of the angle are at zero. So if I use the 90 here, stay on the row, and the 55 here, I can say 90 minus 55 is 35. So it is 35 degrees, and it is acute. Okay, so that's your lesson for intro to angles. Um, make sure you take your notes and complete the worksheet that uh, is on the Haiku page, all right?